Welcome to Imagine Wealth Without Risk, the podcast that guides you to fulfilling your dreams through guaranteed, secure investing. Here's your host, Ted Thomas. Hi, everyone. This is Ted Thomas, and uh, this podcast is titled Imagine Wealth Without Risk, and glad to have you there, and I'm here, and we have a great guest today. And so this will be a little fun. Some people have a lot of experience in real estate. And of the past 10 years, I think one of the most popular businesses has been what people call flippers. So if you're a real estate investor and you heard about flippers, I've got a former flipper on the telephone with us today. He's done very well for himself. And fortunately, he and I met a few years back and he decided to change a little bit. And we're going to talk about some of that today. But Here's a guy that's real talent, and he's made a lot of money for himself, and he's had a chance to look at the markets and so on. His name is Paul Castillo, and he lives over in Salt Lake. And uh, Paul, can you hear me okay? Yes, Dad, I can. I want to talk about tax lien certificates and tax deeds because that's pretty much the title of my podcast. And what I've done in the past is I've told people I like to make money in a lot of different ways, but my favorite is tax liens and deeds. But let's find out a little bit about you so that we can, you can tell the audience about yourself. And I know you come from a family, a strong family, because I've met your mother and I met your sister and I met a lot of your relatives. So let's start out talking a little bit about your family, because I know you have a happy one and you're a great dad. Oh, I bet your daughters love you. They, you take them all over the country. They did more traveling by the time they were 18 than I did by the time I was 28. So I'm sure that you're the great dad that everybody wishes they had. So tell us a little bit about all that. Yeah, thanks, Ted. So I'm 42 years old, and as you just acknowledged, I've got two daughters. I've got Alex, who's going to be 21 this year, and then I've got Savannah, who's 13. And the reason for the big spread is we had a lot of miscarriages in between the two. So Savannah was a real blessing. Yeah, real blessing when she came along. And without a doubt, that's the most important role in my life is being a father to these two beautiful girls. And wow. it's the reason why I do everything I do. And as you mentioned, I love taking them on trips and just being a very important part of their lives. And Yeah. You know, now, you don't just do a trip around the state. You really travel. Tell us a little bit about that. Over the last few years, it, I've been really fortunate. And a lot of that's due to the success I've had using your program. So I really want to thank you for that. But oh, for me, where I'm divorced, I'm a single father. Uh, It's always been important for me to be able to spend some quality time with my children. And so twice a year, I love taking them on a nice vacation. The first is going to be spring break. They work hard during the year. I really write them during the school year to make sure that they're taking care of their responsibilities. And so I think it's really nice for them to have a little bit of breathing room, little break from the school year. And so spring break, I like to just take them somewhere far away where they can yeah. just unwind and enjoy life and visit new places and have some cool experiences. Yeah. And then the yeah. second time is during their summer break. And over the last few years, because of the extra income that I've generated using your program, our trips have evolved from just having to stay somewhere local in our little region of the country to being able yeah. to go to places like I've taken them to the Bahamas. I've taken them to Whoa. Mexico. Uh, we've taken right trips to the East Coast, Orlando to Disney World. We've gone on wow. a 10-day trip to the East Coast where I've been able to take them through, I guess you could say, a historical trip to from Washington, D.C., to Gettysburg, to New York City, Boston, the Trail of Tears. I've really just done it all. It's been really fun. Wow. Gee, that's fantastic. Now, I know you speak Spanish. Now, are these uh, young ladies learning Spanish, too? I haven't done as good of a job there as I wish I would have. And my Spanish is broken as well because they say you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I grew up bilingual, yeah. but when I moved to Cali- from California to Utah at the age of 10 yeah. or 11, we were one yeah. of the only minorities here in Utah at that time. Really? Wow. Yeah. Wow. So didn't really – well. Yeah, yeah. Man, yeah. It's, a lot, it's yeah. a different story now. The, uh, the minorities yeah. have taken over the state of Utah. But, oh, no. is that right? Oh, so <laughs> complete change. So now it's, we know who to blame. Okay, yeah, right. yeah. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's different. Oh, yeah. I guess we let them yeah, open yeah, the yeah. floodgates. But, yeah. but no, they don't, well, they don't speak Spanish as well as I wish they did. Yeah, keep encouraging them. They'll, they'll, all of a sudden, they'll want to speak Spanish. You wait. That's what will happen. Yeah. If they find some of those tall, dark, and handsome Spanish speaking, they'll, they'll, that'll change them quickly, I'm sure. That's, uh, yeah, there you yeah. go. 
Yeah. So you made these wonderful trips and how did you find time to do all this? I know every time I talk to you, you're always diligently working. How do you find time to do all these trips? Fortunately, everything that I do, see, I'm one of those guys that lost everything during the recession, the Great Recession back in 2008, 2009. Ooh. Oh. So just to give you a little oh. background, I've been Please. self-employed since I, I've been fortunate to be self-employed since I was 19, 20 years old. And that sounds great to a lot of people, but as you said, because you're an entrepreneur, that comes with its, with its ups and downs. Right. And so I started a business in 2003. I moved from Utah to Idaho to start this business consulting business. Yeah. And yeah. it did really well for five or six years. But then during the Great Recession, I lost everything. I literally mean everything. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, to, uh, the point where, to the point where I had to move in with a relative. Oh, to, my uh, goodness. That was a come down, wasn't it? It really was. I lived in a 5,000, 5,500 square foot home with the pool, all the toys that you can imagine, four yeah. or five car garage, and took okay. all kinds of trips. But while I did well, I was in the situation where the business was more in control of me than I was in control yeah. of it. And so yeah. in a way, it was a real blessing because when I lost everything in, during those years, it gave me an opportunity to reflect and just think long and hard about what I'd been through and where I wanted to go from there. And that was when I decided that real estate was the right vehicle for me to go into. Oh. And so wow. this was in that 2000. Was pain, that was painful, huh? That was quite a, a, a trip from 5,500 to, I, I don't know if it was a basement or not, but to a relative's bedroom. That was probably difficult, yeah. And the worst part is my sister that I moved in with, she barely, she already had three children, two of which were already sharing a bedroom. And then the third was her daughter who had just a small little bedroom with the princess wallpaper. And that was my bedroom oh my. that I moved into. So it was a oh really, my oh my <laughs> God. Oh. Oh. it was a really oh. humbling experience to say the least. Oh, wow. But, that, uh, that's a, so you know what it is to claw your way back up then, don't you? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But you know what they say? You, it is what you make of it. And so rather than sit and complain and moan and do nothing about my situation, I just thought, okay, this is a good opportunity for me to never find myself in the, cause see, I only had one source of income at the time. And so when that business crashed, that was everything that I had and I couldn't sustain it. And the business that I was running, I realized after this happened that it was very vulnerable to the economy. And so I recall spending some time and writing things down on a piece of paper, making a list of what I had learned, what I don't want to go through again, what was important for me moving forward. And a few of the things that I remember writing down was, number one, I wanted to find something that was recession-proof, that would work in a good economy, bad economy, good real estate market, bad real estate market, you name it. Right. I also wanted right. something where I didn't have ever have to deal with employees again and be reliable on other people. I wanted something where I wasn't going to be a slave to my business like I was with that business for the previous five or six years. And I wanted something that would provide me with a lot of flexibility, something that I could do from anywhere in the world. And those are just a few of the things that I had written down. And I decided real estate was the right vehicle for me to go into. That was a big change, wasn't it? From consulting to uh, to uh, hands-on real estate, so to speak, huh? Yeah, that's right. I oh, always knew that I wanted to get involved into real estate. It's one of those things where, until you really, I guess, until you really have to, or your back's up against the wall, you just cut it off. And that's why I say that losing everything in 2008, 2009 turned out to be a real blessing in many ways. Wow. You have such a good attitude. Your attitude is, uh, you're going to, you're a survivor. You're going to, uh, you continue to be successful no matter what happens with the world around you. You're going to recreate yourself. That's really a good attitude. Yeah. Nice to hear people talk like that. A lot of pessimism out there. It's good for me to hear someone like you talk like that. So, so that's good. So you, did you start transitioning right away or did you study or what, what did you do? So I, I started studying and went to different events, seminars, you name it. Got my hands on whatever books I could find search the web yeah. just to try and you got to start somewhere, right? I had zero experience in real estate whatsoever, but I had also read about how real estate was a vehicle that was used by the vast majority of the most wealthy 
or successful people, not only in this country, but around the world. And so obviously I knew that, okay, there's a reason behind that. When I first got started, I was still working, doing other projects to keep the lights on, so to speak. And I, I knew that real estate, other people may want to tell you otherwise, but I knew that it wasn't a get rich quick scheme. And so I knew it was something that I was going to have to be patient with and be realistic. Yeah. Yeah. Initially, what I so decided to do. I was just going to say, you weren't just looking for income. You were looking for long-term wealth. You could have real wealth that way. Yeah, I, I see. Yeah. Correct. Correct. And so I had a friend at the time that had a little bit of experience in real estate. And so I decided to partner up with him and oh. he convinced me that based on what had happened over the last few years and based on where the economy was at, he convinced me that there was a huge need for a, an alternative investing product for people that had just lost their shirts, lost every well, a good portion of their wealth in their IRAs, in the stock market, you name it. And yeah. they were looking, there was a huge need in the market for an alternative, like a safer investi- investment type product for people that were just scared to death of the stock market. You remember the market yeah. went down like what, 60, oh. 70% at that time? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the federal government had to step in and put money in, otherwise the whole thing would have collapsed. Yeah, yeah that's right. Those, those bail ins or yeah. whatever you call them. Yeah. yeah. And, and and so my first foray, foray was you could it was essentially just flipping, but with a with a little different twist. And so at this time, the banks had a record number of properties on their books due to all the foreclosures, oh. right? That it millions, just, just millions place. of houses. Yeah. And as you said, the banks are not in the business of owning property. Right. And, and so they just wanted to get rid of them. And at this time. This was 2011-ish, like 2010, 2011-ish. You could literally, at certain markets, you could pick up properties from the banks for as little as five, six, seven, eight, ten grand. Gee whiz. Yeah. And so we saw an opportunity there. Again, didn't really know what I was doing, but at least theoretically, it made sense. And with somewhat of an entrepreneurial background or mindset and then having a business partner that had a little bit of experience, we decided that we would start buying these banks or these properties from the banks. And and then we would send a rehabber in there to fix it up. Nothing too extravagant, but um, nothing lipstick either. We definitely felt that people deserve a good place, good livable place that they could call home. And so we would buy the property from the banks and then fix them up, make sure that they were in good livable condition at which point we would put a property manager in place and then put a screened tenant in place that would sign a, on. Uh, we, we would like to get one, at least one more than more often than not a two year lease. And so once the property was cash flowing, then we would turn around and then we would target investors who wanted to use their IRAs, for example, to find a more secure investment than what they were getting in the stock market. So that was our little niche there. And over three years, we probably flipped around somewhere between 15 to 20 homes doing that. Good for you. You had to learn a lot. You had to learn how to do leasing. You had to learn how to hire property managers. You had had to learn fixer upper. I bet that was something, huh? (laughs) Fixing property up. Yeah. Yeah. And we were also doing this remotely. So The market that we chose to invest in was Indianapolis, and here I am in Utah. My partner was down in Texas. And so over those three years, we might have taken a couple trips to Indianapolis, but for the most part, we were doing this remotely. Oh, boy. Wow. Fortunately, you found a lot of people there that could work with their hands and fix them up. Some markets you can't find the fixer up of people, I understand. We had to go through a few. (laughs) We had to go through a few (laughs) and definitely made some mistakes and done things the hard way. Oh, I think I've learned that lesson more than once. I don't know why, but it's, I, I like to buy them now and sell them. Just buy them and sell them. It's a, for me, that's a better business. Sometimes you just have to fix them up, but I get it. Okay. All right. So you've done, so you got a lot of experience in this. What was that? Two or three years of that? Is that what you did? How long did that take? Yeah, it was about three years that we did that and wow. ma- made some money. But I also realized after three years of doing that, the headaches that came with it, I realized that it wasn't the right, not real estate, just that particular model that we were using wasn't the right 
long-term solution. And so that's when I started seeking out other solutions, just looking for a better way. Yeah. And that's when I discovered you and your program. Well, that was good. That was like a bolt of lightning or something. Oh my God, this is impossible. That's what people say, but uh, I hear them say it all the time. It's too good to be true. Yeah. And, And so then what did you do? So what happened is I was, you weren't even aware of this, Ted, because when we first met, I don't think you even knew that I had a little bit of a background in real estate and flipping homes. No, I never imagined such a thing. Okay. 90% of the people that were, that did the business you and I, that you introduced to me, they they don't know a roof from a driveway. I mean, they don't have, (laughs) they don't have any any experience, let alone uh, fix it up or they know the word because everybody, for some reason that, that word flipper caught on to. A lot of people, I guess the newspapers and the TV people like that flipper, you know, and I was doing it on television and those guys, uh, I try to tell people now, don't watch, whatever you do, don't watch those television shows because you're going to go broke. There's no way you can fix a property like they do for what they say. It's, it's impossible. But um, the, those shows keep going on. So, so the flippers just came out of nowhere. What was that? Uh, and suddenly everybody was talking about flippers and here, here you were doing it and I didn't even know. Yeah, you weren't aware of that. If you recall, you, had, you and I were introduced to each other by a mutual, mutual colleague. And at the time, you were looking for a consultant, somebody that could join You're your right. team to fill a, a specific right. role. And right. due, due to my background in business consulting, that seemed to be a natural fit. And right. so here I am, you and I are talking about working together for a very different reason. And I really didn't know anything about. I'd heard the term tax lien, tax deeds. I'd heard a little bit about it, but didn't really know much. And so yeah. when I started learning more about it after we were introduced, it really intrigued me. And yeah. here I am starting to get exposed to your product, hearing about students of yours and how well they'd been doing, the kind of success that they had. And as I learned more about it, the light bulbs just started going off. And I thought, wow, sometimes things happen for a reason. And yeah. here's the solution that I've been looking for all well, along. And, yeah. Now, you had a little experience, so I'm sure that a podcast like this, people listening to, and uh, there's a ton of people that fix up properties, and there's a ton of flippers. But, of course, all those great deals of getting them for 10 cents on the dollar disappeared because everybody went in that business at the same time. Although I, I heard someone was on television the other just a weekend or two back talking about flippers still. So I guess there's still some of those out there. But uh, I don't think people are buying it for 10 and 20 cents on the dollar anymore, anything like that. They're probably paying a lot more. But uh, so how long did it take you to learn how to do it? How to do, are you seeing flipping or how to do? The, the, no, I, I figured you just learn. You never stop learning in the flipper business because that, that, that every house is different. But uh, the, I, I figured the uh, taxing business must take some time to learn. So I was wondering how long you had a little experience. A flipper could get in this business relatively quickly, couldn't they? Yeah, the I, the most important thing is to decide how they're going to approach it, right? So I'll tell you from my experience that when I first learned about this, having yeah. three years of experience flipping, I'll yeah. be the first to admit that I was a little arrogant. And really? my first, yeah, I heard about this. I saw what other students were doing with it. And I thought, oh, how, you know, how hard can this be? And right. so the first thing I did is I knew I wanted to get involved right away and by nature, I'm a little aggressive when it comes to business in general. And so I didn't want to waste any time. And so the first thing I did, Ted, is I bought six tax lien certificates over the counter in Nebraska. Not because I was really okay, interested. No. Yeah, no, oh, wait a minute. You got to back up a little bit. What's over the counter? What does that mean? So over the counter means that the certificates were auctioned off at an auction held by the county, but they didn't sell. And then whatever's left oh. over, so whatever doesn't sell at that auction, then the county has to decide what they're going to do with them. And depending on the state, some counties will offer them what's called over-the-counter, meaning you can call them, oh. get a list, and just buy it any day that you want, oh. while others won't do that, right? And so you have to find specific states that offer over-the-counter. That's what I did, and that's why I bought six states or six liens specifically in in Nebraska. Huh. This is funny. The world wouldn't know this, but the first place I ever bought was Nebraska. Oh, <laughs> really? I, I, yeah, I didn't know yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, in uh, Douglas County, which I believe is Omaha. That's that's where yeah. I bought mine. Yeah, Douglas County. Yeah, Omaha. Yeah, that's right. They had, uh, 
They had a tax collector. They got old there and he didn't sell the properties and they ended up, the county owned 3,000 properties there for a while. And then they brought a guy in to sell them. And uh, uh, I met him and I ultimately ended up employing him. But in those days we used to buy with direct mail, but this is about you. So let's talk about, so you bought these six tax lien certificates. They paid pretty good in Nebraska. Was it 10% or something like that? So Nebraska's 14%. Whoa, and, 14. That's good. Yeah, 14%. Yeah. And so yeah. one of the things that's been important to me is that I don't want to be traveling all over the country, spending time away from my daughters or spending yeah. a bunch of money on flights, hotels, travel expenses, not knowing, you know, you're never know, you never know if you're going to get anything or not because it's an auction based business. So in the beginning, I knew that tax deeds is what I wanted to go after. But because I I knew that I was going to need to spend a little bit of time determining which markets I was going to invest in and getting all my ducks in a row, I also didn't want to let a week become a month, become a year type of a thing. So I wanted to just get in, and that's why I bought six tax lien certificates. So I had that feeling, that sense of, okay, you've done your first deal, and then I could build momentum off of that. And I remember calling the county, verifying that they did offer over-the-counter They told me they'd be happy to send me a list. So I looked through the list. I sent it right back in the mail with a check along with the ones that I wanted. I believe it was about eight of them that I wanted. And then six of them were awarded to me. And and then I remember about two weeks later getting, going to the mailbox and getting that first check in the mail. (laughs) Well, that was making you feel really good. Now you got a business you could do from home. Yeah, you know, I already knew that it worked, but it's just a whole taking it to a whole other level when you actually go to your mailbox and see that check come right from the government. It just gives you a whole other level of conviction. So it was wow. a bitter, it, it, it was bittersweet because it was nice to get the check, yeah. but it was also a little disappointing to see it redeemed so quickly because I wound up making pennies on that particular yeah. investment. Yeah. Whereas if you held it for a longer time, you would have made more money. Correct. Correct. Yeah. But, but again, yeah. for me, it was always about the deeds. And so it wasn't too big of a disappointment. It was just, again, realizing it gave me that much more conviction that, yes, the deeds is where the real money is. Yeah, you were satisfying yourself that you could do it. Uh, it was no longer a question mark at that point. Sure. Yeah, that's fair to say. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you feel it's like the first time you uh, drive the car by yourself. There's nobody over there growling at you. Be careful. Put the blinker light on, blah, blah, blah. You say, I do that all by myself. Nice. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. yeah. And so then what happened? What happened after all that? So what happened is in the meantime, I'm deciding where I'm going to be investing in deeds. And oh. the state that I decided to start with was Washington. Really? So oh, Washington. Washington. Simply because, again, I knew that I wanted to do deeds. I also knew that I wanted to find states that offered bidding online where I could do it from my home Uh and not spend time away from my children. I also decided, and I could have picked a number of different states that fit that criteria, but then Washington, because it's on the West Coast, closer to where I live here in Utah, I just felt like that was, and the timing of it. So this was getting later in in the year in 2015, and many of the states, as this is governed at a state level, and so some states will do auctions once a month, as much as once a month. Other states will do it as little as once a year. And so based on Uh the time of year that it was, knowing that there was a few auctions coming up in the state of Washington within the next couple of months, and that would give me enough time to prepare for the auction, Washington was the state that I started in based on a process of elimination. So let me. Did you pick uh, rural counties or did you pick um, high population areas? What did you do? I, I actually decided that I wanted to start in a rural county just because in my mind, I felt that I would deal with less competition. Now, if I yeah. found that several years later, I found that all isn't always necessarily the case. But that was my thinking back then is 
avoid somewhere like Seattle where every Tom, Dick, and Harry is wanting to invest and maybe pick a thriving market like that and maybe pick some uh, rural counties a little bit further out that are not as well known and maybe there's not going to be as much competition. I see. Okay, good. And that was successful or did you do those online or did you go there or what did you do? Hi, everyone. Want to find out if Paul's deal turned out successful? Tune in next week for part two with Paul Castillo. On next week's episode, Paul will continue to talk about the deals he's made, tips to be successful in investing in tax defaulted properties, and how he did all of this online from home. Thank you for joining us today. Go to tedthomas.com to learn how you can start making smart, secure investments today. Be sure to check out the rest of the episode to find out more about Imagine Wealth Without Risk.